أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين ولا عقبة للمتقين ولا عدوان إلا على الظالمين وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم عبد الله ورسوله ما بعد We thank the Almighty Allah for giving us an opportunity to be here today. We thank Him for His mercies that He's bestowed upon us. We bear witness that there is no deity worthy of worship except the Almighty Allah. We also bear witness that the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, is His servant and His messenger. Whosoever the Almighty Allah guides is really guided. And anybody who goes astray has nobody to blame but themselves. Today is a Sunday, the sixth day of Rabiul Awal, 1,444 years after the Hijrah of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It also corresponds with uh, the second day of October 2022. Uh, Alhamdulillah, this is uh, the first uh, upcoming series on the seerah of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And this is a class that we want to have at least to bring to fore who the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam is, uh, the life that he led, uh, his companions, and this gives us, you know, a better view and a better understanding of what Islam is and how we'll be able to practice Islam. Because the life of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam is the human personification of the Quran. Because for you to really understand the Quran, you must dig deep into the Sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Imam al awzai says that the Sunnah and the Quran have three relations. The first relation is that the Sunnah comes to emphasize what the Quran has already said. So, for example, in the Quran, the Almighty Allah says. شهد الله أنه لا إله إلا هو والملائكة وأول الإلم قائما بالقسط لا إله إلا هو العزيز الحكيم. This is the شهادة. In another verse, the Almighty Allah says in the Quran, وأقيم الصلاة. That is صلاة. In another verse, the Almighty Allah says, وأتى الزكاة. That is زكاة. In another verse, the Almighty Allah says, يا أيها الذين آمنوا كتب عليكم الصيام كما كتب على الذين من قبلكم لعلكم تتقون. This is fasting. And in another verse, the Almighty Allah says, وأتم الحج والعمرة لله. One hadith comes and brings all of these together in the hadith of Ibn Umar, where the Prophet Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم says, بني الإسلام على خمس. Islam has been built on five days. Shahada to Allah ila illallah to the end of the hadith that you all know. So this is the first relationship between the Sunnah and the Quran. The second relationship between the Sunnah and the Quran is that the Sunnah comes to expose and elaborate and explain issues that the Quran has made into one volume. For example, when the Quran says, Wa aqimus salah, offer salat. What is that mirat al ihram? How do you do ruku? How do you do sujood? How do you do tahiyya? It is the sunnah that comes to explain that. The Quran talks about zakat. How do you give out zakat? What percentage do you give out of zakat? Or what time are we supposed to give out zakat? We don't know. It's the sunnah that comes to explain. The Quran speaks about fasting. What are the invalidations of fasting? When do you begin sahur? How do you do it? Is the Sunnah that comes to explain. And then the Quran speaks about Hajj. How do you perform Hajj? Where is Arafah? Where do you perform Tawaf? How do you put down the Ihram? Where are you supposed to put on the Ihram? Is the Sunnah that comes to explain. So the Sunnah comes to explain to us issues that the Quran has put into what into a volume. And then the last one is 
The Sunnah comes to speak about issues that the Quran is silent upon. There are some issues the Quran is silent upon. It is the Sunnah that comes to explain that. For example, the inheritance of a grandmother. The Quran doesn't speak about it. It is the Sunnah that explains that the grandmother has one sif when it comes to inheritance. And there are other things that the Sunnah comes to speak about that the Quran is silent about. So these are the three main, you know, relationships between the Sunnah and then the Quran. We're in the month of Rabiul Awal, and most often than not across the world, uh, people deem it the month in which the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was born, and then there are celebrations concerning that. Uh, actually, we don't have an authentic narration from the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that says he was born in Rabiul Awal. We don't have one. The only narration that we have concerning the birth of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam is that hadith in Sahih Muslim where he said he was born on a Monday, and that's it. But as to whether which of the month it is, he didn't say that. And the exact year is also not known. There is only one incident that has the link to the birth of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, which is the year of the elephants and Arabs did not have a system of counting. They have numbers, but they didn't have a system of counting of years. So you realize that they only use events to denote issues. So for example, the year of the elephant. So the year of Aboni, that is the year Khadija and Abu Talib died. So that's what they used to do. It was in the 17th year of Hijrah. During the time of Umar ibn Khattab, one of his governors by name Abu Musa al-Ash'ari wrote Umar ibn Khattab a letter. That, the Amir al-Mu'minin, I have a couple of letters from you to me. And these letters have Ramadan, Ramadan, Ramadan on them. But I'm not able to differentiate which of the Ramadans comes first. Because if not, there are no years. It's not like Ramadan 2021, Ramadan 2022. It's just Ramadan, Ramadan, Ramadan on all the letters. So I'm trying to arrange the letters, but I can't, I, I can't, which one comes first? So Umar ibn Khattab gathered the Sahaba. So this is the problem that we are facing. Another narration says that two people came to Umar ibn Khattab with a problem. I've come to you to borrow money. And it is time for me to pay and I'm saying, no, it is not this Ramadan, it is next Ramadan. Because no year has the radio on it. So Umar ibn Khattab gathered the Sahaba to solve the problem. So some of them said, why don't we use the dating system of the Romans or the Persians? And they were like, we're Muslims. <laughs> why will you use something that belongs to the Prophet? We need to be independent. We need to be autonomous. Some of them said, okay, why don't we use the birth of the Prophet Muhammad as a starting point for counting of our years? They said, we don't even know when he was born. We only really know that he told us he was born on a Monday. Others brought their ideas, but in the end, they settled for the Hijrah. When the Prophet Muhammad left Makkah for Medina, they agreed that that was the time that the Muslim community became independent. They could do whatever they want to do. They were free, and that was when they were able to legislate laws. But then, the Prophet Muhammad did not migrate in Muharram. He migrated in Rabiul Awal. So how come we have Muharram to be the first month of the year? They had a discussion again that why don't we make Hajj the last activity of the year? So after the pilgrims leave Makkah to go back to their homes, in their countries, the next month becomes the first month of the year. So that's how we had the Hijri calendar. So the birth of the Prophet Muhammad was not something that was documented in terms of the year and then the date. No, because the Arabs didn't have that at their time. All we know is that he was born on a Monday. But majority of historians say that he was born in Rabiul Awal. Majority of them. Some of them even said Rajab. Some of them even said Ramadan. But majority say it is Rabiul Awal. And then the other thing is that they did not even agree on a particular day in Rabiul Awal. It's just that majority say it's the 12th of Rabiul Awal. But others also say it's the 9th of Rabiul Awal. 
So these are some of the issues concerning the birth of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the month and then stuff like that. But it's not an issue for us to discuss uh, whether it is okay to celebrate the Mawlid or not. It's not an issue for us today. We're going to look at who is the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Because before we delve into the seerah of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, at least we should have a fair idea of who the man was. Something small about him. Jabir ibn Abdullah narrates a hadith that Mahdi Umar ibn Khattab was holding some parchment of Torah. And he came to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he said, Ya Rasulullah, inna nasma'a min al-yahood a hadith tuhjibuna afanaktubu ba'adaha. Say, Ya Rasulullah, these Jews have some very, very interesting stories. <coughs> Why don't you write some of their stories? Why don't you copy from them? They have some beautiful stories, Ya Rasulullah. Some beautiful things in their books. And the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Ya Umar, Amuta Hawi Kuna Antu. Umar, are you guys going to be confused? Kamata Hawakati Yahudu and Nasara. Same way the Jews and the Christians got confused about their religion. You see that they have something beautiful? So you're getting confused about Islam? I know there's a huge lesson here. This very point, there's a huge lesson here that we've got to a point whereby some Muslims are confused about the religion and they're just speaking anything from anywhere. Maybe we discuss that another time, another day. And the Prophet told Umar, Ya Umar, لَوْ كَانَ أَخِي مُوسَى حَيًّا مَا وَسِعَهُ إِلَّا اتِّبَاعِ If Musa himself, the Torah was revealed to Musa, right? If Musa himself was alive, he wouldn't have any excuse but to follow me. If Musa himself was alive, the Prophet was telling Umar, he has no excuse. You just have to put the Torah aside and come and follow me, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This tells us who the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is. If every Prophet, when they come and then they come and meet the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, they will have to leave Whatever they are doing to follow him shows he is the Imam al A'ar. Wallahi ma khalaq al ilah wa la bara bashar yura ka Muhammad al Bayn al Wara. Wallahi the Almighty Allah has never created anybody. Neither has he fashioned any human being yura ka Muhammad that has the likeness of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. There's nothing like him. In our series, we will get to a place where we will discuss the physical features of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The hadith of Umm Ma'bad explains to us the physical features of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. This is who the man is. Someone who was unleaded. Someone who grew up as an orphan. But then within 23 years, he was able to change the Arab landscape. The Arabs who were shepherds, of goats and sheep and camel who couldn't write. Some historians said that Makkah had only seven people who knew how to write when the Prophet Muhammad was born. Only seven people who knew how to write. It was a place where it was, you know, secluded from the rest of the world. The world was not even interested in the Arab Peninsula. The Roman Empire and the Persian Empire were not interested in what was going on there in the heat of the desert. Because to even get to them was an issue. You have to go through the heat of the desert. You lose soldiers. You will die. So the world was cut off from these people. They were cut off from the massive civilization that the Romans had. And the Greeks had and the Persians had. These were just goat herders. But within 23 years, the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was able to change that landscape. And these people, the students of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, were able to rule the known world for 1,000 years. That was the legacy that the Prophet left. From the mountains of Siberia in the north to the Indian Ocean in the south. From the mountains of Mongolia in the east to the doors of Paris in the west. This was the land of the Muslims. And no empire had that size before. They were able to rule the world. Harun al-Rashid will stand on the member 
and then you see a cloud moving and then you talk to the cloud metaphorically you will tell her oh cloud you can release your rain wherever you want to release the rain wherever you want to but then the taxes that will come from the food of that rain will come to me Harun Rashid that was how huge the Muslim empire was due to the legacy that the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam left I don't need to tell you what not Muslims have written about Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam you know of Michael H. Hart, who wrote the hundred most influential men in the history of the world. And he had no excuse but to put the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam up there first. And he was asked about his choice of Muhammad. He was a Christian. I think he was a Catholic. He was asked, "Why did you put Muhammad first? And because he was the only known man." To have been excellent in every sphere of life. He was a husband, he was a father, he was an in-law, he was a statesman, he was a leader, he was a judge, he was a warrior. Every aspect of human life, if you check it, the Prophet Muhammad played a role there. He said, Jesus Christ was not a father, he was not a husband, he was not a statesman. So you couldn't have influenced any psychological thoughts. For humanity, he didn't have that. And not to degrade Jesus Christ or downgrade him, but that is the criteria that Michael H. had used. Bernard Shaw, an Irish, an Irish man, says, if Muhammad was alive now, he would solve the problems of the world by just sitting down and drinking coffee. That's all. That's what the non Muslim said. After studying the life of Prophet Muhammad, he said, if Muhammad was alive now, in the 20th century, he will just solve the problems of the world by just drinking coffee. You just sit down, he drinks coffee, and then he gives solutions to the problems. And you find Muslims today who do not want to practice what the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam came with. The Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam has some right to the ass. Hey, this is just a prelude to what the seerah is 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 all about. Hey, in this series, we are not just going to talk about history and story and then we enjoy the stories. No. It's based more on picking lessons from it and then inculcating them in our lives. It's not like, oh, during the time of the Prophet Muhammad. No, no, no. That's what we're going to do. So we're going to take our time and go into the books and, you know, pick the information and decipher them. Previously, I wanted us to use a particular book. But... I realize that one book will limit the kind of scope that we want to discuss. So bring it from this source and bring it from this source and bring it from this source and bring it from that source and put them together will help us. And even me as a student of knowledge, that is better for me, for, for my growth as a student of knowledge. Because if I bring only one book, I'm going to just going to remain on that book. I will not be able to expand, you know, my horizons when it comes to the seal of Prophet Muhammad so because a lot of books I've written on Sarah. In my library alone, in my library alone, I have close to about 30 books on Sarah. Not to speak about the library on Sarah. <laughs> in my humble library, I have about close to 30 books that I've written on the Sarah. Then imagine the books that I've written about Prophet Muhammad. Even within Islam alone. Not looking at other people from outside Islam who are critics, who have written bad things about Prophet Muhammad Imam al-Bukhari narrates a hadith from Anas bin Malik where the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says La yu'minu ahadukum One of you will never attain the highest level of Iman Hatta akuna ahabba ilayhi min walidihi wa waladihi wa nasi ajma'am None of you is going to attain the highest level of Iman until I, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa becomes beloved to him more than his parents, his kids, and every person in the world. Now, Muslims do not understand who the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa is to us. That is why they get confused. Why do these Muslims... Uh, 
someone who lived in the seventh century in the desert and <laughs> Muhammad is sacred for us. He is a different ball game altogether for us. That's it. That's who Muhammad is, is to us. Because he was sent to pull us out of the trenches of darkness to light. He is our savior. Not in the sense of you know, the Christian word savior. No. Ours goes beyond that. Because we leave Muhammad, we eat Muhammad, we drink Muhammad, we dress Muhammad, we want to look like Muhammad, we name our kids Muhammad. I think a recent you know, survey in the UK says the number one name of new babies in the UK is Muhammad. Yes, in the UK, the number one name for newborn babies, boys, is Muhammad. And the Muslims are, are said to be a minority in the UK. But Muhammad is the number one name for babies. This hadith is explained better. The hadith of Abdullah ibn Hisham, where he says, We were with the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam held the hand of Umar ibn Khattab. And Umar ibn Khattab was very pleased that the Prophet had held his hand. And he said, Ya Rasulullah, you see in this world, I love you more than everything else. Except myself. I love you more than everybody and everything, but except myself. As for myself, I don't think I can love you more than myself. And the Prophet Muhammad said, La, ya Umar. La. Walladi nafsi biyadi hatta akuna ahabba ilayka bin nafsi. I swear by the one that my soul is in his hands. That Umar, Umar, your level of piety and Iman will not reach that peak until I, the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you love me more than yourself. And Umar Abu Khattab said, La anta ahabu ilayya min nafsi. Okay, Ya Rasulullah, I love you more than myself. Some people will ask a question. Why would Umar, Umar change his answer, make 180 degree turn all of a sudden one time? Imam al Khattabi, one of our scholars in Hadith, explains this and then he says, Love for yourself is natural. Loving yourself is natural. Nobody hates themselves. Who hates himself? No. Love for yourself is natural. So you can't force someone to hate themselves. But Umar bin Khattab, when he realized that the coming of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa is pulling him out of darkness, is the light and the guidance that he gets towards the Almighty Allah, he realizes that the love of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa is better than loving himself, Umar, because loving himself is not a path to Jannah, but loving the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa is the only path to Jannah. When he realized that, he changed his stance and then he said, Ya Rasulullah, la anta ahabba ilayya bin nafsi. Some people love some people more than themselves. It's possible in life. Some people will kill themselves to make some people happy. Some people will go to length. Simple example, we and our wives and our children. We'll go through the weather to pay the bills. We'll go through the weather to pay the fees, to make sure they have good food, good clothing. Sometimes some of our fathers do not even have clothing, new clothes for 10 years. But they make sure that we, the children, are always happy. So they prefer their wives and their kids on themselves. So it's, not, it's nothing new that we say Omar loves the Prophet Muhammad himself, or we Muslims love the Prophet Muhammad more than ourselves. But there's an issue here. The way some of us react to the negativity stores the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. I wouldn't say all is correct. No, no, no. But when someone does something bad to the honor of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, maybe the Danish cartoons, the Charlie Hebdo guys, and the stuff like that, how some Muslims react. It's not all, it's not, it's, it's not all right. No. Who didn't agree to that? 
That when someone does something wrong to the Prophet Muhammad we go on rampage, burning ties, destroying buildings, destroying cars. No, it's not right. I remember the Chaplain Abdul issue when it happened. I was in Niger. It was scary that day. Huh? They went on a rampage, burning everything that belongs to France. Destroying churches. I saw one funny thing, but also very painful. One guy was drinking alcohol. Allah He held alcohol and drinking. He's going to destroy a church. Allah I saw him. In the evening, some guys were like, hey. It's like today, we we'll don't drink alcohol anymore. Because they themselves are going to destroy all the drinking bars in the communities. So, some reactions that some Muslims have. It's not the right reaction because these people do not know who the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is. They've been secularized to the point that they don't hold people's religion sacred because they don't believe in those things. And then they've lost that respect for humanity to the extent that they want to castigate against the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. They don't do that for Jesus Christ. They don't do that. Because they understand the role the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam played in our lives. Because if you see a Muslim you see an adherence to the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. That is what they don't understand, that someone living in the 7th century has a profound effect on people in the 21st century. In a time whereby someone is planning to send citizens to mass for them to stay in mass. And you are here wanting to live like someone who lived in the desert, who didn't have electricity, who didn't have flowing water, who didn't have... No, no, no. He doesn't understand that it infuriates him. Instead of sitting down to really understand who the Prophet Muhammad is and reading about him, they go and do all kind of things against him. There is a hadith of Rabi'at ibn Ka'b ibn Aslabi in, in Sahih Muslim where Rabi'at says that I used to sleep at the house of the Prophet Muhammad so that I will give him his water for wudu for fajr. For fajr. And then one day the Prophet Muhammad has asked me, Ya Rabia, do you have any request? Ask me anything you want. You've served me for all this time. Ask me something. He said, As'aluka muraqfaqataka fil jannah. Say, Ya Rasulullah. You see, the same way I'm with you here in dunya. I want to be your companion in Jannah. Even those you and I, that the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam asked us a question. That, ask for something. I personally, I might ask for a million dollars. But Rabbi Atu says, As'al murafaqataka fil Jannah. I just want to be your companion in Jannah. And the Prophet said, maybe something else. Okay, you can get this one, but maybe you need something else. He said, ah, here, here, ya Rasulullah. It's the same thing, I don't need anything. Look at the person's love for the Prophet Muhammad That he's lived with him, but he feels that, no, 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 it's not enough. I want to be with him in Jannah. The hadith of 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 Thawban, or the hadith of Umm Umm Al Mu'minina Aisha radiAllahu anha, explains this. This is reported in, in At Tabarani, where Aisha says a man came to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. He said, Ya Rasulullah, when I'm with you, my iman levels go high. But when I go back home, my kids, my wives, and stuff like that, the level of iman begins to drop. I want to be satisfied until I move to come and meet you, Ya Rasulullah. But then, I have a problem to be. And the Prophet said, what is your problem? He said, Ya Rasulullah, this is the dunya. Anytime I want to see you, I rush to the masjid or I come to your house to see you. But I'm afraid, maybe in the akhirah, when we go to Jannah, you will be in the highest places of Jannah. And I might be in the lowest places in Jannah and I might not be able to see you, Ya Rasulullah. This is who the Rasulullah is to these people. 
that he 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 scared that in Jannah he might not be able to see us all alone. That is how these people took the man. And today we are just living anyhow. We 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 just do whatever we want when it comes to the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. That we want to enter the same Jannah these people are going to enter. Come into our homes and see how much of the teachings of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam we implement in our homes. How much of the teachings of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam we implement in our workplaces, in our lives, in the lives of our wives and our children. How much? This guy was concerned that Ya Rasulullah, in the dunya, I can see you any time I want. But when we go to Jannah, and you are there in Firdaus al-A'la, will I get the permission to come closer to you? Will I have that opportunity to get closer to you? And all my children revealed the verse. وَمَا يُطْعِ اللَّهَ وَالْرَسُولِ فَأُولَٰئِكَ مَعَ الَّذِينَ أَنْعَمَ اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِمْ مِنَ النَّبِيِّينَ والصديقين والشهداء والصالحين وحسن أولئك رفيقا ذلك الفضل من الله He said those who really follow the Almighty Allah and the Prophet those who follow the Prophet Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم كله in the dunya فأولئك on the day of قيامة مع الذين أنعم الله عليهم they are going to be with the people that the Almighty Allah has blessed them من النبيين Amongst the prophets, was Siddiqeen and the truthful people, was Shuhada and the martyrs, was Salihin and then the good people, was Hasuna Ulaika Rafiqa. This is the best kind of companions we're going to have. At this juncture, the question comes up: What really is the love of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam? When we say we love the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, what do we mean? Thank you, brother. What do we mean? Is it lip service? Is it shouting Allah Akbar? And that's it. What does it mean when we say we love the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? The scholars of Tawheed and Aqeedah have given us four guidelines. The first one they say is Ta'atuhu fi ma amar. Obeying the rules of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. I always say this. It is only the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that you close your eyes and hold his dress and then he takes you to Jannah's directly. Nobody has that. One day Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, the companion of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, who happens to be the first 40 people to accept Islam. One day he was entering the masjid. And Ibn Mas'ud says that there is no verse in the Quran that me Ibn Mas'ud I don't know when it was revealed, where it was revealed, and why it was revealed. And the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, if you want to listen to the Quran the way it was revealed, listen to the Qur'an of Ibn Ummi Abd. That is Abdullah al Mas'ud. Abdullah al Mas'ud one day was entering the masjid. His right leg had entered the masjid, and his left leg was outside the masjid. You know, you bring your right leg first before the left leg. So as he put his right leg in the masjid, he heard the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam say, Sit down guys, sit down guys. And then he sat down like that. The Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was teaching and then he looked at the door of the masjid and Abdullah Mas'ud was sitting there like that. The Prophet said, Ya Abdullah, what's happening? There is space in the masjid. Why are you sitting there like that? He said, Ya Rasulullah, my right leg entered the masjid and my left leg was outside. I was going to pick the left leg to come into the masjid and I heard you say, sit down, sit down, sit down. I'm scared. The angel of death takes my life then. I go to Qiyamah and Almighty Allah says, Abdullah, Muhammad says, sit down. You walked. Why? He said, I don't have any excuse. I don't have any explanation for that. You've gotten to a point whereby the hardness of the Prophet Muhammad is, is just peanuts to us. We don't care. 
And then when we mention people who love the prophet Muhammad and we are there at the forefront, we want to kill people, we want to baptize, we want to break down buildings. But then the day-to-day -day activities and lifestyles that we, we are into, the prophet will say, Suhqa, suhqa li ahula. Drive them away, I don't need them here. Abdullah ibn Umar, the son of Umar ibn Khattab, radiallahu anhu, one day he was riding his camel on the street of Medina. And then you see that he would turn the camel this side, and then he would bring the camel this side, he would turn the camel this side, he would bring the camel this side. And he said, Yahibu Umar, why don't you walk in a straight pattern? He said, I turn my camel this way and that way. This is after the death of the Prophet Muhammad Because I want the foot of my camel to step where once the foot of the camel of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam stepped. That's it. This is, this is how these people... That is why when Almighty Allah says, It's final. That the Almighty Allah trusts them. He's pleased with them. And they are pleased with Almighty Allah. It's because of these actions. Abdullah ibn Umar again. One day, someone, you know, sneezed. Hechi. And the person said, Alhamdulillah. Wassalatu wassalamu ala rasulillah. And Ibn Umar said, La, 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 la. The Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, If one of you sneezes, you should just say, Alhamdulillah. He didn't say, And then you do salat on me, ya Rasulullah. That's it. Obeying the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is all light and all guidance. It's all light. Wallahi, well, observe our lifestyles now and ask me, and let me ask myself, and let's ask each other a rhetoric question. How much of the teachings of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam do we inculcate in our lives? How much? Is it only the physicalities? We grow the beard, we have our, you know, our, our dresses hanging, and that's it. How much? The sunnah is rich with lifestyle. It got to a point whereby the Jews in Medina will mock the Muslims. Hey, that's for you Muslims. Muhammad teaches you everything, even how to go to toilets. He taught us that. How to go to toilets. The Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa taught us. Let me ask you a question. If the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam teaches us how to go to toilets, do you think he will not teach us how to do businesses? If something like going to toilets has been taught to us by the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, do you think living in other people, he would teach us? If the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam taught us what to do when we sneeze, he ching. Even how to sleep, we don't respect elders. Even how to have intimacy with your spouse. Islam teaches us that. And then you find Muslims reading all kinds of books in sociology, in psychology, in communication, in psychiatry, and in, 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 in listen to all kinds of motivational speakers. And then the Sunnah is there for you. That is your motivation. That is your energy, that is your power. That is what makes you different. The Muslims dominated Europe from Spain and Portugal and Sicily in Italy. It got to a point by in Europe, in Europe, if a young man wants to tell a girl he loves her, he says it's in Arabic or Hebuki. That was the swan of the time. Same way now you see an African like man like me who has not gone to school, doesn't know English. He wants to tell again he loves you. I love you, I love you. He says it in English because English language is the dominant language now in the world, whether we like it or not. Because they they carve the path for it. That is the language of enlightenment now. That is the language of education and knowledge. Because they carve it for themselves. But a thousand years ago, it was the Arabic language because of the influence of the Muslims. Because they stood steadfast on the sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. They obeyed him. But you and I today, no. So that's the first one. 
The second sign of loving the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam is tasdiquhu fi ma akhbar. That is affirming what the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam is saying, not doubting it. We've got to a point whereby some Muslims are so advanced. They live in the 21st century and they're like, no, no, no. This hadith doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense. So, no, no, no. Put it aside. No. Scholars of hadith have authenticated. What are those scholars? I'm, I'm a free person. You know, I'm a free thinker. And I think outside the box. So, this hadith doesn't make sense. You know the hadith of the fly? Where when a fly falls into your food, you definitely having scientists prove that they proved it. A lot of hadith. This coronavirus that came in, and we had this quarantine. The Prophet Muhammad introduced quarantining sick people long before medicine was even advanced. The hadith is the hadith of Usman bin Affan. When Umar bin Khattab was traveling around, you know, having assessing you know this nation he got to a place whereby there was a pandemic he got to Sham and Abu Ubaidah Ta'amir bin Jarrah was the governor of Syria at that time and it was even in that pandemic that he died uh, it's called is it Amun Amwas? I forgot it again Ta'amun Amwas the pandemic of Amwas so they got there, and Abu Ubaidah came out of the city to meet Umar halfway. That Amir al meaning we have a problem in the city. There's a pandemic, and people are dying. What do we do? Umar bin Khattab gathered the Sahaba again. This is, this is a lesson to myself and students of knowledge that if an issue comes up, don't be quick to give fatwa. This is the problem of the age. Some of us students of knowledge, we've read one book, two books, three books, we think everybody else is stupid, we are the wisest people. So we are always in a hurry to give fatwa. Haram, halal, we are going to Jannah, we are going to hellfire in the Secretary of State for the Almighty Allah. We are sending some people to Jannah and sending some people to hell. Umar bin Khattab, if an issue comes up, he gathers the Sahaba. He said, what do you guys say about this? Does anybody ask? Does anybody hadith from Prophet Muhammad concerning this? And they bring the ideas, this one will say, and then I think Uthman bin Affan said, I have a hadith from Prophet Muhammad where he says, if you hear of a pandemic in a place, don't go there. And if you are in the place and the pandemic strikes, don't leave the place running away from the pandemic. Isn't this what they did to us for the past two years? And then Abu Ubaidah said, ah, Amir al-Mu'minin, Afiraran min qadarillah. Amir al-Mu'minin, are you running away from the qadr of Allah? You've come here to enter the city. Enter the city. Whatever happens is the qadr of Allah. And Umar bin Khattab said, Why haka ya Abu Ubaidah? Abu Ubaidah. If I had hoped someone else would have said that, not you. He said, Abu Ubaidah, Naam, Afiraran min qadarillah ila qadarillah. We are running away from the the color of Allah to the color of Allah. So these are some of the things the hadith of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that some people now no 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 they are too advanced and they no 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 these things are away they don't care Muslims because you know maybe they live in the West or stuff like that. There is a book called the Bible, the Quran, and Science by Professor Maurice Bouquet. He's a French doctor. The history behind the book, as it was said that some people in the French government told him to write a book desecrating the Quran. And then after researching, he told them that he can't do that because he doesn't speak Arabic language. The Quran is originally an Arabic language. So he needs to study the Arabic text first. Because he's in academia. He's not able to write anything that two years or three years later someone will just come and then destroy his work. So he needs to write something credible. If he's going to make a critique of the Quran, 
It should be a credible critique that is going to be used in academia. It's, it's fine. So he went to Egypt and then he studied Arabic language for five years. He became fluent in Arabic language. He understood the Arabic language purely. So after writing the book, he came back to Paris and there was a press conference. And he gave them the book. He said, this is the book that I've written. The Bible, the Quran, and science. But before I tell you anything about the book, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah. And they said, you guys, you're stupid. They said, you're stupid. Please get the book. I think it's about 200 page book. And read it. And you will confirm a lot of scientific facts that the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said them years ago. They were just discovered maybe 50, 60 years ago. Science is not the yastic to measure the Quran, no. Quran is not the yastic to measure science. But because we live in a technological age and an advancement age, you need to speak to the people in a language that they understand. That the Muslims of the day, especially the ones here in America, that's the language that they understand. It's about science and technology and inventions. So if you speak to them that Muhammad, somewhere in the desert, in the 7th century, Allah has spoken about these things. They are bewildered. Professor Kitmo is, is a Canadian. He's a professor in embryology. He said, when he came to Surah Al-Mu'minun, verse 10 and 11, where the Almighty Allah speaks about the embryo, the creation of the embryo in the womb, he said, that, he said something very profound. He said, there is no way Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam could have known this on his own. There's no way. Because the stages of the embryo and how it was being described in the Quran, he said, Muhammad would need a telescope to zoom in and see what's going on in the embryo. They didn't have telescopes then. He said the other option was that Muhammad had to find pregnant women, cut them open, and then look, and then write. Another stage, cut them open, and look, and write. And then he said, even if he did that, you'll not be able to see anything. Because that state of embryology, and embryo, embryo in the womb, you need a telescope to see that. Or a microscope, sorry. You need a microscope to see that. And there was no microscope at that time. So, this is who the Prophet Muhammad was. So Professor Kitmo says that there is only one source that Muhammad وسلم, could ever have this information, but it means it is directly from the Almighty Allah. So these are scientific fields. What about theological and mythical things? The Prophet Muhammad made mention about the punishment in the grave. And angels would descend in the grave and they would hit a person. If he's bad, he would sink down. Someone would say, no, 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 this doesn't make sense. We are told that the angels are bigger than the dunya, but the angels will enter into a great grave, small grave like that, and then they will hit a person and stuff like that, and that they have a hammer that is bigger than the dunya. No, 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 this is foolish talk. It doesn't make sense. We Muslims, for us, whatever the Prophet Muhammad says, so long as it has been authenticated by the scholars of hadith, this is the truth. Whether your mind is able to capture it or not, that is not our business. Because if you make the mind the yastic for measurement, something makes sense to you, it doesn't make sense to me. Something makes sense to me, it doesn't make sense to you. So in the end, the thing becomes a soccer ball that we juggle on our legs. No. The relationship between the soul and the body at different stages differ. When the person is in the womb, or even before that, when the person is at the level of the sperm, the relationship between the soul and the body is different then. When the person enters the womb of the mother, sperm, and then it becomes an embryo, the relationship between the baby, the spirit, and the body is different. It's not the same. Than as it was in the sperm stage, stage. for example, when your wife is pregnant, you will not say that, oh, this baby, how does he eat? And let me cut you open and give you some bomb eater and some milk for you to drink in there. <laughs> do you do that? No. Because the relationship between the body and then the soul at that time is different. When the person is born now, the stage now changes. 
from when it was in the womb to when it is, when it is in the dunya. Even in the dunya, the studies are different. For example, we are having a class right now. Someone might fall asleep in the class. And after some few minutes, he woke up. And he said, ah, oh, sorry, we are having a class. And they were asking, what happened? Well, like when I was asleep, eh, in the sleep, I saw that I made about $5 million. And I have a huge home. I have a Lamborghini. And as I was going to receive another $20 million, that is when I woke up. Would we say he's lying? I didn't get your answer. Would we say he's lying? Yeah. No. But the, the thing happened in reality. It never happened. Because in sleep, the relationship between the soul and the body is different from when you are awake. The relationship between what? The soul and the body. That is why sometimes you sleep, you see your grandmother who is dead and then she speaks to you about current issues. In your sleep. That is why you sleep you see in your dream, you see the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and then he's giving you an authentic message. He's speaking to you about things that are happening now in your time, those things that didn't happen in his time. You wake up and then you feel that, yes, this dream is true. But it didn't happen. It didn't happen because the relationship between the body and the soul during sleep is different. Same way, the relationship between the body and the soul at death is different. The relationship between the body and soul in the grave is different. The relationship between the body and soul in Jannah is also different. So some of these things are things that we need to put our minds to. So whatever the Prophet Muhammad says, ask the scholars of Hadith, let them authenticate the message. If the statement is authentic, even if it doesn't capture your mind, that's it. For example, this Hadith of, you know, pushing the fly into your food when it falls down, if the scholars of hadith a thousand years ago have said, no, this is nonsense. And then they scrapped it off of our hadith book because it didn't make sense to them. We look at the hadith today that the scientists have authenticated. No. So in Islam, we juggle the mind and then the what? The text. The text guides your thinking. Your thinking doesn't guide the text. Because if you use your thinking to operate on the text, you will scrap a lot of even verses from the Quran because it doesn't make sense to your sense. And our level of understanding differ. Some people have high IQs, some people have medium IQs. So if you use your low IQ to say you are going to check things in the Quran and cancel some verses, you'll be doing yourself a disservice. So this is the second one, which is affirming what the Prophet Muhammad says. I don't want us to take much time. The third one is Ijitinabu Manaham. Be mindful about the warnings of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Things that he warned us against. Allah. And these are the very things that we are practicing. Simple thing. The Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam warned us against expensive and extravagant marriages. But we don't care. Some of us fathers, it's as if the girls have business plans for us. And I need to make cash out quickly, make profits. So the list that they will give you, you the prospective husband coming, the list of things that they want from you before they give you their daughter in hand, if you look at it, you get hypertension. If you look at it alone, your blood pressure goes high. You love the girl, she loves you. But because of all this class, caste, status, reputation, and dignity, and money stuff, you can't get married. And you have an apartment. She comes to visit you. And then the wrong things happen. When the wrong things happen, and she becomes, she gets pregnant. Oh, wallahi, Imam, no. Hey, wallahi, Brother Ibrahim. Let's do this fast, fast. And things are not going to. It's because there's an illegitimate pregnancy. That is why now they want to fast track the marriage. Make marriage easy. And zina will be very, very expensive. But if you make marriage expensive, zina becomes cheap. The young men want to get married. They are Jimmy. They are tests. Uh, testosterone is always high. And all these young girls going around in all these funny clothes, these guys cannot control themselves. 
Sometimes you come to the room of the boys and on their beds, you have all kinds of maps. This African map on the bed. Yes, because of nocturnal emissions. And these are realities that the young men are facing. And the young girls also are facing these things. So what happens? They send each other naked pictures of themselves on their phones to, to cool down the temperatures. <laughs> These are the realities. Fathers, that you are listening to us. If your daughter gets to the age of marriage, in your world here is 18 years, and there's nothing you can do about it. And she has 18 year old or 19 or a 20 year old guy who is interested in her. Even though they might be in high school, they might be in college. If you have the means, marry them and keep them in your house. In the morning, you drop them off at school. After school, they come back home. They are in your home. You pay their bills. You take care of them. You know America more than I do. The kind of bills one must pay. The kind of, you know, taxes one must pay. So most of you people or most of us start life at a disadvantaged position. And this makes it very difficult for young people to save. Because 18 years, he himself even feels like 18 years, no, I must leave home, I'm a big man, I'm a big man. He goes in and he has an apartment, he has to pay about $800 a month, or about $1,000 a month. And then he makes only $3,000 a month. He pays gas, he's going to US, use a car, and then he's going to pay the amenities. Maybe he pays $200, $300 a month for lighting and water. And then he uses gas, $300 a month. Almost half of the money is gone. Not to talk about food, not to talk about clothing. So these are the challenges that young people face. And the Prophet Muhammad so foresaw this long time ago and then he warned us against it. But we don't listen. We want to move with the flow. We want to move with the swag. So it brings us problems. Imam's daughter, pregnant. Muazin's daughter, pregnant. Shura's daughter, pregnant. Like we ship them to Africa because we don't want to have the disgrace here in America. <laughs> this is the problem. And you know it's more than me. So that is why it's, it's good for us as Muslims to build a kind of bond between us that at least I know my son had Salam's daughter. We just start pairing them together and then we marry them. Either they stay in Alumas house, they stay in Hassan's house. We pay the bills. We take care of their school fees so that we protect their chastity. We protect their dignity. We protect their reputation. But then, our society is so corrupt to the extent that a girl cannot get married until she's 18, but she can start having sex when she's 13. So by the time she's 18, five years of experience, she's a veteran. She's a veteran. And she's tested all kinds of boys. So by the time she's 18, she's not interested in marriage because she gets sex free outside. When she's now 25 that she wants to get married, she's 25, but when you see her, she looks like she's, te- she's 45. And then she marries you, maybe you are Ustaz, Ustaz. And then you don't have the engine capacity to take care of her in the bedroom. What happens? She moves outside. She's married, but then she has boyfriends outside. What happened is because she started doing that when she was 13 and 14 because the community and the state law says she can't get married until she's 18 but she can have consensual checks when she's 16. This is the problem. That is why you have a lot of single mothers in America today. And the, the physicians tell us, the psychologists and psychiatrists tell us that America's number one problem concerning vices and crime is because of single parenthood. So you know the problems that you're facing. But you are the ones who are causing the problems. And then you know the solutions, but you don't want to follow the solutions. So if you live in such a situation as a Muslim, what do you do? You nurture your kids on Islam. And teach them what the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam teaches us to do. You can't marry her off when she's 18. You go to jail in America. It's only in Africa that you can marry her off and then nothing is going to happen. But here you go to jail. So what you're going to do is have the kind of relationship with your kids, with your kids, well, no matter how difficult they are, no matter how bad they are, don't throw them outside. Because if you throw them outside, you've given them the liberty to continue to be bad kids. I know the internet is not helping. I know sometimes some government policies do not help. 
Because in public schools, they are, the kids are being told, if your parents are disturbing you, this is a number, call. So it, 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 it causes antagonism between parents and their kids. So you cannot even apply reasonable discipline for your child in the home. When a child feels like you are worrying that you just call and then they pick your child away, they go and give it to someone else who turns them into something else. So please, parents, the strategy of parenthood in America is different. And even in the 21st century. Because when I speak about America, don't think everything is rosy and cool back home in Africa. No. We are having worse challenges than you. I'm telling you. We are having worse challenges than you. So it's a global phenomenon. The advent of social media has corrupted a lot of our kids. TikTok, Snapchat, WhatsApp. Oh, it's something else. So until we return to the seal of the Prophet Muhammad we will not be able to straighten our face. So let's heed to the warnings of Prophet Muhammad Finally, this last point is a broad topic on its own. We will tackle it another time, which is Make sure that whatever you are going to practice in Islam is from the office of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Whatever practice you are going to have. Make sure stamped, sealed, and signed by the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. This point talks about innovation in the deen. It's a very serious issue. When you bring in something new in the deen, not in the dunya. In the dunya, we need you to innovate. We need you guys to have all these brilliant ideas in STEM. Bring all these new technologies. Yes, we need that. Innovation in the matters of the dunya is wajib. Because without these you know, air conditioners and heaters, uh, we will die out of, 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 of cold. Even me, that, you know, I just came recently and this small weather is destroying me. And when I complain, they say, oh, Sheikh, keep quiet. It's not even yet winter. And then you are complaining. I say, eh, it's not even yet winter. And look at me, all shivering. In the room at night, I need to put our two or three clothes and then get the blankets. Without innovation, how will we be able to survive? But in the deen, there's no innovation. Let me give you an example. One day, during the time of Imam Malik, Someone came to the Muslim and said, Ya Imam, min ayna uhrim? Where will I take my ihram for Hajj or Umrah? And Imam Malik told him, Dhul Hulayfa, miqatu ahli Medina. Go to Dhul Hulayfa, outside Medina. Those of you who have been to Hajj know that from the Masjid to Dhul Hulayfa, how many minutes it is of driving? How many minutes? I mean, the last time I didn't take my miqat in Dhul Hulayfa, so I don't know Dhul Hulayfa. How many minutes? 20 minutes? 20, 25 minutes. So 5 miles. Oh. Well, let's say 10 miles. 10 miles. So from the Masjid to Zul Khalifa is about 10 miles. And the man said, La, me, I don't want to take my miqat at Zul Khalifa. My ihram, no. I want to do it in the Masjid near the grave of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The question here is, the Masjid and Dhul Hulayfa, which place is better in terms of significance and importance? Generally, generally, generally. The Masjid of the Prophet Muhammad and Dhul Hulayfa, which one is more significant and which one is more important? The Masjid. The Masjid. But then, Imam Mali told him, La inni akhsha alayka fitna. I'm scared for you. He said, Ah, La Imam. It's just a few miles. <laughs> and then he told him, Do you think that you know better than the Prophet Muhammad when he knew his masjid is better than Zul Hulayfa? But then he said, Go and take your miqat at Zul Hulayfa. You know, sometimes in innovation, people have good intentions, yes. That, oh, no, you know, this thing is a nice thing, it's a good thing, but in effect, it's not a good thing. The only two questions I give in this, in this place, which is, when you invent something in the thing, in terms of a ibadah, in terms of anything, there are two questions that I always ask you. The first thing is, this thing that you're doing, does the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam know about it? 
If you say yes, did he do it? No. Then you are accusing the Prophet Muhammad of hiding knowledge. Because he knows, but he didn't teach us. And then you are now teaching us. You have an issue to answer on the day of Qiyamah in front of Prophet Muhammad because the Almighty Allah told him, Ya your Rasul, Balik ma unzila ilaka min rabbik. The second question is, does the Prophet Muhammad know it? If you say no, you are accusing the Prophet Muhammad of ignorance in the team. These two questions are very dangerous. There are ways whereby the scholars have taught us to, to be able to decipher what Bila is. Fil Adat, in the number that we are being taught in Ibadah. For example, Isha is how many rakats? Four rakats. And you, you came today and said, Today I have a lot of energy and my Iman level is high. I will give Allah two rakah bonus. And then you did six rakah instead of four. Is the Salah valid? No. no. Because the Prophet taught us only four. Fil jins, in the type of Ibadah. In Udhiya, Idul Akbar, because you have money, you realize that oh, the goat, sheep, cow, and camel, you don't have enough meat, so you went and bought elephant to slaughter for Allah. Wow. Is it going to be accepted? Yeah. No, because elephant is not part of the animals that the Prophet Muhammad said we should use. You might have a good intention. There are a lot of poor people, there are a lot of so, as for elephant, you know, it's big. No. Fil Makan, the place where you are supposed to do the Ibadah. Oh, as for us, you know, it's a very nice place. So when it is Zuli Hijjah, I'll come and wear my ikram and I'll come here with you. Labaik Allah, umma labaik. Labaik Allah, sharika laka labaik. In Alhamdulillah. Is it going to be accepted? No, because that is not the place to do the Ibadah. And the, it's a whole lecture on its own. And our time is fast spent. We've taken much time off the brothers. So this is just the first episode. It's just an introduction to the Sira series we're going to have. Today we looked at who is the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the rights of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam over us. Inshallah, next week we're look, going to look at the significance and the importance of the Sira. Why do we study the Sira? Inshallah, next week we're going to look at that. The subject we're going to look at the birth of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, how his birth came about. And so going to be episodes, and each episode we are going to give you the title. So you go to the Wasapia page on Facebook, you're going to have them. If you go to my personal page on YouTube and Facebook, you're going to have it there too. And you can follow it. You're going to have audios too. Uh, we're going to have all that, inshallah. Uh, thank you very much for listening to us. Uh, I, know, I know there are going to be some questions. If I crave your indulgence, if brothers can stay behind for those questions, inshallah. Jazakumullah khairan. as If you can s stop this, okay. Because most of them are not uh, questions. Fatwa might be, there is end. Do you see end there? Hello? Oh, yeah. Yes. Yes. My uncle can see what he's saying there. Okay, it's ended. Very good. There isn't been...